Johnson. Good evening, Lord Mayor and members. Can I advise the Chamber that apologies for absence have been received from Councillors Rosie Jolly, Barbara Mace, Gary Miller and Hayley Todd. Are there any other apologies, please? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Can I remind those present that this is a meeting held in public and not a public meeting? I would also like to emphasise that this is a key public meeting. Can I therefore request that everyone present including the public, treat this meeting accordingly, which will enable the business to be dealt with effectively. The use of social media and filming for reporting proceedings is permitted during council meetings. This does not extend to the filming of members of the public, and anyone wishing to film the proceedings are also particularly directed to the very sensitive issue of filming children without the express permission of their parents. Can I ask the permission of the Council to allow the palantipers to record the proceedings which are projected on the large screens in the Chamber? Is that agreed? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Declarations of interest. Can I remind members that you are only required to declare at meetings any disclosable pecuniary or prejudicial interest, in which case the member will need to leave the Chamber during the consideration of that item. Are there any such declarations, please? Thank you. Can I also remind members that if an amount due in respect of his or her council tax has not been paid for at least two months after it became payable, then he or she should not vote on any question concerning a calculation relating to setting of council tax, precepts or limitation of council tax and precepts, any recommendation, resolution or other decision which might affect the making of such calculation and administration or enforcement matters in relation to council tax. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Right, item two. Um, uh, the minutes of the council meeting held on the 14th of January. Is that agreed? Thank you. <coughs> item three. Public question time, Chief Executive. Thank you, Lord Mayor. In accordance with the requirements of standing orders, can I advise the Council that there are no petitions to be submitted and also no statements to be received at this evening's meeting? Uh, this is a budget meeting and with the permission of the Council in terms of timings of speech for budget items, um, I'm suggesting that Mayor Anderson has um, 20 minutes to speak, uh, the mover of an amendment and the right of reply uh, for 10 minutes and all of the speakers to be allowed 5 minutes and with the consent of the Council, a two-minute extension to allow the maximum possible number of members of councils to uh, members of the Council to speak. Are we agreed to that? Um, are you happy with that? I know it's not in the Constitution. It was only by terms of guidelines and in order to keep a, a good framework for the meeting this evening. Right. Okay, well, I'll take it as agreed, and uh, we'll, I'll be flexible if necessary. Okay, thank you. Chief Executive. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I advise members that card votes will be conducted as prescribed under Standing Order 25 of the City Council Constitution, when amendments <coughs> and the budget motion are considered, and shall be recorded in the minutes of the proceedings, whether members cast their vote for the decision or against the decision, or whether he or she abstained from voting. Thank you. Item 4, Mayor Anderson. 
Lord Mayor, can I uh, move the statement to the Chief Financial Officer on robustness of estimates for 2015-16 to 2016-17 and the statements of the Chief Financial Officer on the adequacy of provisions and reserves for 2015 to 2016-17. Uh, uh, can I move that the statements of, of the officer and the robustness of those estimates uh, be agreed by uh, the council, please? Okay, we agreed on that. Yeah. <coughs> we move to item five, Mayor Anderson. Lord Mayor, th th this of course is um, the second year of our three year budget plan. So before I, I talk about the uh, challenges that we still face uh, as, as a city, I think it's also um, it, important uh, that we recognise uh, the hard work of the officers uh, of this council in what they've been undertaking on our behalf over the difficult period and times that we've faced. So can I begin by thanking uh, Becky Hellard and her team um, her finance team for all their support to me and to the chief executive um, during the last um, well over 12 months as you know we've faced an onslaught um, by this government in terms of financial cuts not just um, for last year this year and next year but since 2010 so can I thank um, Becky and her finance team for all the work that they've put in not only supporting me but also giving advice and information to um, the opposition. I uh, also thank the Chief Executive as well uh, and the Executive Directors uh, of, of the Council who have been working uh, extremely hard under di difficult decisions and with a, a reduced number of staff, something that I think we often overlook. So as we look forward uh, to the next 12 months, and I don't mean look forward in a happy sense, but look forward to the challenges that we face and not only the next 12 months, but beyond that, over the next uh, 24 months, I think it's important that we recognise how professional and dedicated our staff are, and with their extraordinary commitment to the people of this city. Um, special thanks I would also uh, like to pay to our union colleagues, uh, to the Joint Trade Union Council and its members, as, and they, in, in my opinion, are a real source of pride uh, to this council in the way that they have understood the difficult decisions that we've had to make and they also fully understand only too well where the blame lies for the difficult decisions uh, that we've had to take. I think it's also important to recognise the work of our partners within the city who've um, worked with us to actually move and drive our city forward. The business community, for instance, the NHS, the universities, community groups, social enterprises, charities, our schools and many, many others, too numerous to mention, who worked alongside us to make our city uh, what it can be uh, today and what it is uh, for the future. Tremendously committed to helping us work uh, for a better city. I think it's also, from my point of view as well, as Mayor of the City, but also leader of the Labour Group, to actually put on thanks, um, on record, my thanks to all of my colleagues uh, in the Labour Group, but equally to all the Cabinet members on the Council who've engaged with the budget process, and also pay uh, tribute to Councillor Radford and the Liberal Group for taking part in the earlier discussions on, on the budget, which actually uh, we set our three-year budget proposals. I really do value and appreciate your commitment and support as we face uh, the tragedy of implementing cuts and the worst cuts, as I keep reminding people and telling people, that our city has ever faced in its history. So again, um, as I did last year, I stand here with the unenviable uh, task, really, of trying to explain what is almost a near impossible situation. And it's uh, with that in mind that I talk about the conundrum and the conundrums that we actually face as, as a city. How to deal with, of course, a predicament of growing demand for our services and a shrinking budget and which stops us providing the services that people require and need. 
and also, of course, a reduced workforce. So that conundrum is becoming more and more difficult as the months um, go on, and they will continue to be even more difficult and more challenging uh, as we face um, the ideological onslaught. And you hear me uh, make that uh, statement quite a lot during my contribution. The ideological onslaught of attacks on public services and local government placed on us are even more responsibilities with the dilemma of having fund and cut. And as I said, I've got to explain to people within this city how we've got new responsibilities like the Care Act and how much of a burden that places uh, not only on us as a council but on officers and also on the voluntary sector within the city. Last year in adult social care we spent in reserves around about 11 million. This year it's predicted we'll be spending at least uh, 11 million pounds of our reserves and that shows how desperate the situation really is and how precarious our financial situation really is. You know, I remember um, a, a politician once saying around militants uh, in this city and how they operate it. He said that you can't play politics with people's jobs and people's <coughs> services. And let me uh, say to this council that those comments should be addressed to a government with clearly uh, an ideological focus on attacking public services and also making the poorest pay for the wealthiest and for the wealthiest and for the mistakes that have been made by the wealthiest within this country. Not uh, a Labour previous administration, but the banks who caused uh, the chaos and the predicaments of a financial time bomb that we all uh, now face in local government. Let me also say that that playing of politics has happened nationally, but it also happens here locally in Liverpool. And it's a shameful way and a distasteful way uh, to try and exploit the plight and the predicament of people in this city who are suffering at the hands of the government cuts. But that's what the opposition here in the council do, the local uh, opposition in terms of the Greens and the Liberal Democrats uh, are absolutely doing on a daily basis. While officers and councillors and cabinet members are working really hard, it's the Greens and the Liberal Democrats who are given the false impression that things can be different. That's why I coined the phrase around the Greens that they're no more than militants in sandals. The phrase I coined, but it is true and absolutely true, they are no better than the militants, exploiting uh, the difficulties, as I said, and promising a utopia that they did 30 years ago, exploiting the struggles that people are facing uh, within the city. The similarities between them and uh, the, the 80s charade uh, that this city went to under militants, the similarities are today. Yes, we've got that ideological attack by a government and we've got the same government supported by the Liberal Democrats who are holding their coats as they bludgeon not only this city but many other cities. But the Greens, of course, are, are trying to play politics with the finances of our city in the same way, in the same way that Militant did in the 80s. And as I said, you know, they tell us we should stop managing the city's finances. You'll see that in the amendments tonight. Don't move forward with the financial responsibilities that you have to run our city. Let's freeze the cuts. No, they're not talking about a brain freeze. They're talking about freezing the financial responsibilities that we have in the vain hope that we may get a different government that sets a different tone towards supporting uh, local government. And in the same, and at the same time, of course, when everybody in our city, you here within this chamber, especially on this side and on the top level, understand and see and witness the heartache, the welfare attacks and the cuts, what do they want to do today? Increase the council tax by 6%. Add 80 pounds to the lowest council tax bans, which of course are the main 
properties that we have within our city. So adding an even extra burden to the people of, of this city. They're not aware, of course, of the food banks and the fact that those people who are going to pay that extra £80 a year are those very low earners that are using the food banks that we're actually supporting. So, you know, another brain fade or another brain freeze, call it what you want. And we see, of course, if you look on their website, they're advertising for a worker in the city who can come up with stunts. That's what it says. That's what the website says. That can come up with stunts. Proud of that, we Looking at coming up with stunts. While you're masquerading uh, as, as people that support the people in our city, you want to increase the council tax by 6%, and you want to actually tell us to freeze how we operate this city with the responsibilities that governments, whether it's local governments or national governments, should have. You want us to return back to the 80s? I think my description of militants in Sadville is really a, a nice one. And of course, they're here this week, they're here this week in their conference in our city, but they're not taking it to Brighton. <laughs> you wonder why they're not taking it to Brighton? You wonder why they're not taking it to Brighton? Well, the MP from Brighton has disowned the council. Disowned them, doesn't want to know. Absolutely, you know, J Jason Kitkat is, is, well, I won't go there, but boss, basically Brighton is the lowest recycling rate in the country. And that's why they're bringing the conference here. Um, and they don't want it to be there because of ridicule. That's the reason why. But, you know, I looked at the, um, the brochures for the conference and this is the truth. I'm not making this up. I promise you. One of, um, one of the sessions at the gathering, one of the sessions is called Building a Green Economy. How can we build an economy without growth which can provide jobs and prosperity that people need? There you go. That's what it's called. Well, let me give you an answer to your question that you're posing to your delegates. You simply can't. You simply can't. You simply can't do it. It's a fact. So they then talk within the statements around this particular agenda, they talk of a post-growth economy. Post-growth economy. And of course we know, I mean that's like saying that that you know you can have post-calorie food or post-silverware in football. God, I only wish that existed forever, but silverware, football. It really is you know, a contradiction in terms, but it's really a classic example of the post-reality politics that that particular party plays. And that's why I'm glad they're here in Liverpool. I'm glad they're now getting the exposure because it shows exactly what we know. But then let me turn to... Um, Councillor Kemp. He's now changed his name, of course, to Mr. Kemp. He tells people that he predicted months ago um, how we were going to solve our problems. He predicted it months ago. How he told uh, the radio recently on children's centres that, that he could have told us back in November what we were going to do. He said the same over well, live, but well, of course, we know he's not Mr. Kemp. We know he's really caustic. Um, as he belittles and ridicules the work of our officers and councillors and cabinet members within the city. Whilst they're all working on trying to save libraries and children's centres, he wants to look at every opportunity to try and condemn them and try and ridicule them and say he knew best. And when you look at the £3.5 million that we brought in to save the libraries and the children's centres, he predicted that. He predicted that we didn't need that money, that we were going to get that money, and therefore save them. Yeah, well, of course, it would be wonderful, wouldn't it, if he could predict the lottery, because then he might win it and move. But he's not, so he's going to stay here. But let me tell this council, you know, that all he represents, and the oxygen that he gets in, in publicity is amazing. He represents 3% of the council. That's all he represents, 3%. 
And you know, in politics, there's an old saying about opinion polls. There's an old saying about opinion polls. And it says that 3% is in the margin of error. When you look at opinion polls and whether they go up and down, 3% is a margin of error. It's the gap between something being right and something being wrong. Neither one thing or the other. I think that's a great description of the Liberal Democrats, isn't it? Mr. 3%. Um, and, and you know, I think um, in your world, your world and mine, the world in which we operate in, when your staff are working really hard in difficult times and are committed to helping our city move forward, burning the midnight oil, going the extra mile, when they're doing that every single day, in my view, it's right that you take every opportunity to say well done and to praise them and to congratulate them on doing what they're doing. Not to attack them and say, well, could have told you that's what was going to happen. What a nonsense. And recently, you know, <laughs> you couldn't make it up. It really is similar to the Greens. You know, we talked about Millennium House. Um, was it yesterday or the day before, of course? It was printed as usual because the press know no better, but it was printed. And he said on Millennium House, and he used to call it Millstone House. Those of us that have known them a long time, a lot longer, that's what he used to call it, Millstone House. Well, let me tell you, we get £23 million pound a year in council tax, thereabouts. Over 50% of our council tax is paid on PFI payments. That is administration left for me. That's what I call a millstone. That's what I call a millstone. Something that his administration and he, as a Liberal Democrat, left for our city. But you know, whether Mr. 3% wants to explain to us, you know, the fact that we got round about £4.1 million pound for Millennium House, £3 million for the sale, and £1.2 million, or whatever it was, or whatever it is, it's thereabouts for an investment in the gymnasium, bringing in more people, bringing in more people that pay more revenue to the council, creating 200 jobs. Maybe he'll tell us, maybe he'll take the opportunity and I'll give away, give away if he wants to tell me whether he's got some paperwork that shows us that we can get a better deal. Or maybe he can tell us if we fail to get best value, because we did, because legally we have to, and legally we did, and I'm proud of the deal. Asking, saying he'd give excuse me, excuse me, I said if you want to ask me to give well. Oh. Well, well, ask him. Ask, 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 I thought well, we could ask him. Well, yeah. yeah. Councillor Kent, S sit down. And if you ask him, are you asking Lord Mayor, are you asking the Mayor to give well? Yes, yes, and I'll give yes. well. Uh, I can tell you that I haven't got a clue whether we got best value for Millennium House, and neither does he, because it wasn't put out to the market for tender. <laughs> Lord Mayor, what an insult and what a smear to this council. The reality is we got best value because that's a legal requirement, and we got best value. It was a specific offer in terms of developing the gym and providing a hotel with 200 jobs. Nothing wrong with that. If the Liberal Democrats would have done more of that in their tenure of office, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. So I'm proud of what we did and I know what we could have got, but if you can prove that we could have got better, show me, show me the report or show me whoever it is you consult with who can show us where we would have got better, because it's another smear. And it's another insult, and that's all we get from you. So either put up or shut up. That's my advice to you. But you know what? This is Mr. Three Percent, who spends more time uh, jetting off, jetting off around the world, um, telling people how important he is, instead of spending more time with the deputy prime minister, telling them about the damage that's being done to our city on a daily basis. <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, doesn't want to know him. Doesn't want to know him. I ask you why? 
you know, the evidence is probably clear for everybody to see. But the fact of the matter is, is we all know that the Liberal Democrats sold themselves for a few ministerial cars and a few jobs. And the, uh, the only person I now see trying to fight to join the Liberal Democrats is Chris Reynolds. <laughs> Everyone else is leaving. Let me then turn to and remind people of the challenges, of the scale of the challenges that we face within our city. Let me talk to people and just remind you of where we are with that. In 2010, we, between then and now, we will have lost 58% of our funding. Indisputable fact. Not my figures. The Chief Financial Office figures. Figures that we've challenged the government to come and see, but they refuse to do so. Between 2010 and now, well, when we took control, let me explain it this way. When I took control and became leader with the Labour Party in 2010, we used to receive £514 million in government grants. Today, we receive £265 million. When I took over, <coughs> Councillor Gladden and myself had in adult social care to spend on your behalf, to spend for people in this city, £224 million. It's now down to £172 million and it's got to come down to £130 million. 22,000 people used to receive care packages. Today, it's around about 15,000 people receive care packages and it's got to go down to around about 9,000. That's the scale of the legacy that we've been left by this government. Tory Liberal Democrat government. And of course then we've had the uh, welfare cuts, we've had 2,300 jobs lost to our city. And if you look at the, uh, the situation that we're, we're now in, in terms of um, where we go and how we cope, it is becoming daily a challenge that is the most difficult set of circumstances that we could ever have thought about in our worst nightmare. Every single day, the challenges that we face, the officers of this council, are so severe. And, and, and also, can I say, on behalf of some of the officers and the cabinet members that have to face these decisions, it's heartbreaking. Absolutely heartbreaking. But let me tell you that uh, there is now less money, of course, circulating in, in our economy. If you look at the government's own figures on spend, um, we have been reduced by about £714 uh, per person within our city in comparison to uh, Wokingham, for instance, that's around about £6 or £7. So the evidence and the figures uh, are there because it's not the same everywhere. Down in and as I said, David Cameron's leaping backyard, the cuts per household there is £31. In, uh, in Osborne's patch, patch in Cheshire East, the cuts are at 77 In Liverpool, as I said, it's £767. Ten times deeper, the cuts. Um, so, you know, that phrase about all in it together and the big society are things that we need to remind this government of. And we need to remind the people in this city who are apathetic about going out and voting and telling us that there's no difference. But believe you me, there's a difference. Because if we get this government in any form back again, then our city faces one of the bleakest times in its history in terms of 2017 and the damage that would be inflicted on us. So when I talk about also getting the average cut in terms of council, what councils get across the country, it would mean if we got the average, not the lowest, I'm so, sorry, the highest in terms of proportion of grant, if we received the average cut, the same as everywhere else, the average cut would be £80 million pound better off. So that's what uh, Councillor Kemp should be telling um, his Deputy Prime Minister, who of course made the absurd statement that there's no children's centres closed within the country when we know there's 600 children's centres closed across the country. Um, and you know, all we've ever asked, all I've ever asked, 
on behalf of you, on behalf of the people of this city, is for a fairer deal. We've not asked them to um, give us any favours. We've not asked them for more than anybody else. We've just asked them for a, a, a fair deal. No special treatment for Liverpool, just a fair deal. And like many other Northern Councils, uh, we've had to make uh, ma massive strides, massive strides, massive cuts in curtailing um, our overheads, uh, cutting our co cloth, if you like, uh, to fit. And so that's why we've lost jobs, that's why we've put services. And, you know, SIP for Farm, um, that council from the from central government has been cut on average by nearly a third since 2010. So again, they're not my figures, these are reputable organisations who've given that. And of course, we've actually received more than that. So things are nearly twice as bad as that third cut, twice as bad here as we've got 58% um, cuts. Well then, you know, the question is often asked, well why is um, government penalising Liverpool? Well, the plain truth of the matter is there's no votes here for Tories or indeed for Liberal Democrats because we've always tried to work constructively um, with this government because we recognise that three quarters of our funds quarters of, a, of our funding that we spend in this city actually comes from uh, central government. So, you know, we are treated in a shameful way. Um, and as I said, we, that's why I've called on the churches, that's why I've called on community groups, that's why when we were down lobbying on Saturday to protect our children's centres, I asked them not just to have Cunard as a, as a focal point, hands around Cunard, but to actually have hands around our city. Because as we were speaking, at that rally, or as people were speaking, and I was down there, letters were dropping through people's door, you know, through the letter boxes, telling them how care support was going to be cut from the people that need it within our city. That, that's happening now. As I said, as we actually reduce the number of care packages from around about 15,000 down to 9,000. But the next government, you know, clearly has um, a job to do. And I hope and pray for this city that it is a Labour government because, you know, we have got some real uh, difficult choices to make um, by the time we get to 2017. And I've said often enough over the last few months that all bets are off in 2017, all bets are off. The um, respite that we've given to the children's centres. And by the way, can I just say that we've set up a task group. I've set up a task group. We'll be announcing the membership that, but I've asked Paul Klein to chair that task group, who's been uh, only too happy to accept uh, the responsibility of chairing how we manage, uh, along with Councillor Corbett, how we manage and move forward uh, with uh, reconfiguring and saving our children's centres for the future. So I'm delighted uh, to announce that today. But you know, the reprieve that we gave children's centres uh, and the way we've saved some of our libraries is something that we should all be proud of because it's brought together some partners and some organisations and agencies and charities and different people to actually enable us to do that. But as I said, let me uh, be absolutely clear that that is testimony to them and their commitment to our, our, our city. And it really is a symbol in some ways about how our city unites and comes together in really difficult times. But, you know, unless we get a change of government in the forthcoming elections, um, and let me tell you, you know, to those that are considering not voting, this is the most important elections in, for, for this city in decades. For this city in decades, because 2017, I genuinely, uh, and I, I keep telling people, this city falls over. We will only have enough money to pay for our statutory services. That's all we will have. It's a pity that the Greens and the Liberal Democrats were involved in the budget setting uh, process for three years. Because even Councillor Radford and the Liberals fully understand that challenge that we face, fully accept that we're doing as much and as best we can in, in difficult times. Local government needs the brakes slamming on austerity. Pickles has got away with the ideological attacks. And when 
you know, I hear, you know, Kemp and I hear his, his, his cohort down in, in London saying that they've actually slammed the brakes on the severity of the cuts. Jesus wept. For me, not in this city, has the brakes been slammed on austerity. Go talk to the people out there who are struggling and suffering on a daily basis and tell them that the brakes have been slammed on austerity, on austerity by the little Democrats and they laugh at you. So services won't be reduced in 2017. They'll disappear. That's the stark reality of why the elections in May are so important to this city. Um, and not only will we be forced only to provide the statutory services, some of them will be reduced as well, even more. And that is an inevitable um, consequence of the continuing funding cuts. So let's hope that people recognise that they can't let this happen, not just here in Liverpool, but across the country. So I said last year, our aim is to become a city in control of its destiny. I've said on many occasions that our city has to be sustainable. And when I say that, I don't mean in the green sense. And yes, under this administration, our city, despite the stunts of the Little Democrats and Councillor Kemp, our city is the greenest administration this city has ever, ever had. And so when I talk about sustainability, it's about the sustainability. It means that the 70% of people that come and work in our city, who travel away from our city to live in Caldy, or to live in Formby or Southport, or up in Witness or Halton or wherever they go, they work in this city and they go back to their houses in the highest council tax bands. I want them in this city. We need them in this city. We need them to pay for the services for those that are living in the lowest tax bands, for the elderly, for the children that need education support, for special educational needs, and for people who are desperately in need of our support. That's why we have to grow a sustainable city. And that's why my job is not to make it happen overnight. I wish I could. I wish I could. I can't. But we have to put our city on a sound footing for the years to come. Because irrespective of what government we get, there will be continuing reductions in local government funding. But one thing, one thing that a Labour Party has promised is a, a redistribution, a fairer redistribution of local government funding. And if we get that, that means that the £80 million we'll get for being allocated our fair share of cuts will mean that we'll be able to protect those very services that we're actually cutting today. So our city has to become sustainable. And you know, there won't be growth in the green agenda as they promise. There will be growth in the green agenda, but there will be growth in a business community that actually wants to invest and come to our city. Not when in the 80s people turned away because we were a basket case we no longer need to think the basket case mentality of let's look towards the next few years to see if we can get ourselves out of it. No, it's about promoting our city, our city as a place to invest and to come to. And that's what we're going to continue to do. We're going to be you know, talking about uh, what this city has to offer in the future. That's why we won the right to have the uh, International Festival of Business back here in 2016. We know already that that's created around about £250 million pounds worth of inward investment. We know that's why UKTI and the government actually want to support it again and it will make a real difference to our city. And last week I was down not only at a launch of IFB 16, and, and got a great reception for what we're doing with Dr Vince Cable championing our city and what we're trying to do in creating growth. But equally, I was actually, uh, I attended after that uh, an event in our embassy, the Liverpool Embassy, so ridiculed by people, but actually delivering investments and bringing investments and 400 jobs being created through uh, the contacts that people who use our embassy have been making and investment that's being uh, made there. 
So let me tell you this, because I want to make sure that we remember again the phrase I talked about on many, many occasions uh, when delivering um, speeches, whether it's to the voluntary sector, the business sector, to you, to the schools, parliaments, or to people within this city. I talk about the best of times and the worst of times. How difficult and how bad it is for people who are having to use food banks, people who are desperately trying to make ends meet within this city. This administration stands up for you. This administration with its values and its principles is your party. You're the people that we were elected to represent and serve and we'll continue to do that with responsibility. So in a couple of weeks time I'll be presenting to the Mayor Select Committee a report uh, on our excellent success on delivering the mayoral priorities. Our schools, our jobs, our houses, our sustainability and a cleaner, greener city. Liverpool is being talked about across the world in terms of investment and investment opportunities. So we're making progress, we're making real progress. It's not slow, it's consistent and progressive and it is welcomed by businesses within this city. Next week I'm going to Mippen to actually promote our city backed by 28 businesses who are paying for the council to go to champion them. It's not a jolly. I've got six and eight meetings every single day. I'm proud to do it and work hard. Let me say this to those who call it a jolly. I love my little kids and I love my kids. And every day I want to be with them, not going anywhere on jollies. It's about working hard to bring investment to this city, jobs and growth. And that's why we'll be there shouting about it with six meetings a day or ten meetings a day, whatever it takes. And the, back, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the private sector in this city are delighted that we're going. So much so that it's not going to cost the Liverpool City Council that and we won't be having a jolly. But you know, it is also... Um, absolutely clear to me that those days when I said um, about our city being and looking towards its future because I can tell you as I will do the mayoral commission when we talk about um, the manifesto commitments that we made and how they're being delivered you, know, you look at the exhibition centre and the hotel next to it. You look at the initiatives that we've made and created, bringing in, again, hundreds of jobs. The Aloft Hotel, derelict for 30 years, brought back into use by the Mayoral Investment Fund. You look at the Tobacco Warehouse. You look at Ed's Lane, stalled. You look at Project Jennifer, stalled. You look at the Boot Estate, now proud to be called Norris Green again and a village. You look at 4,700 houses, 1,400 houses brought back into use dental properties. You look at this moment in time, one and a half billion pounds worth of investment in our city, following on from the year before of a billion pound in our city. You look at next year predicted to be another billion pound investment in our city. You look at the apprenticeships that you've created. You look at the support we've given to the poorest and most vulnerable. Education maintenance allowance. This council, sorry, the previous council, Liberal Democrats, cut the educational maintenance allowance set up by Council Prendergast. The Tories cut it. This council reinstated it and gave it to people. 1,800 uh, young students, I was there last week celebrating with them and talking to them about how we want to try and protect that money. If you look at the food banks, the money we've put in there, you look at what we've done as a council in terms of uh, the credit unions, a million pound into credit unions, and you look at what our way, our staff are doing to help those most in need through the uh, work that they do, whether it's 
helping them get through the benefits maximisation team. You look at what they're trying to do. Every single day, this council is moving a step forward. And that's why I have absolutely no problem in repeating every single time I meet people and we talk about austerity. Yes, we've got some difficult days ahead of us. But I know one thing. You kick the people of this city and they stand up and kick back. You kick them hard, they'll get up and kick you harder. The best days for this city lie ahead of it. And that's why it's with a heavy heart that I have to say, I have to say that the budget that we put forward to you tonight, the second phase of our three year budget reduction plan has to be accepted. But I recommend it to you to vote for it with a heavy heart. But remember those words, best days that our city lie ahead of it. Thank you. The amendment I'm calling for is very, very minimal. The finance chief has looked at it over and it's legal, um, but the chief executive has decided that he's not going to allow it tonight, so I'm asking you as the Lord Mayor whether that's going to move. The amendment, Mayor Anderson, is worth £42,000. I'm sure no one in this room will lose any sleep whether I move an amendment over it or not. Right. Lord Mayor, the, the position is very simple to me. The, we had uh, sets of arrangements whereby all uh, councillors and all parties were required to submit uh, amendments so they could be uh, verified and appropriately considered. Uh, whilst it might be in itself a small amount, it is the precedent about the fact that if we let this one come through, then in future any individual councillor can uh, seek to either uh, distort or indeed possibly even wreck any budget or council meeting because it won't give us the opportunity to be able to take a, a fair, balanced and appropriate perspective to it. That's, it's, it's as simple as that. There's obviously nothing against what Councillor Morrison is trying to achieve, but the uh, system is in place for a very good reason. Everybody else has, has kept to it and I think it's only fair to, uh, to rule that to be the case. Councillor Morrison, is there a Hang on, let's just deal with one thing at a time. Councillor Morrison, is there a particular reason why you were not able to move the amendment to us? Yeah, my issue is, uh, which, is yeah, which I talked about with Mayor Sad this morning, is that the council summons doesn't tell us about the consequences of the funding cut. So, under the listing of CO, 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 is a cut to two domestic violence charities in this city, which is worth forty-two thousand pounds. I was I was alerted to this yesterday at four o'clock. I received a letter, so I've now got this letter that states these cuts. I just want to raise this side as I'm, as I'm saying to them, it's forty-two thousand pounds. If everybody wants to talk, thank, down, thank you, Councillor Morrison. Right. Uh, what I was asking for really was there's some breakdown in communication as to why you were not able to move it. Could I suggest um, that um, you uh, speak to the main when no? Can I suggest that you speak to the main motion and you ask then if what you're proposing might be accepted rather than it being an amendment? No, I, I feel that um, I feel as on this occasion that people have had. Well, well, No. Well, what, what I'm trying to suggest is, um, as I was going to say, um, that the, the business of this meeting I'd like to run in as follows. So, Mayor Anderson has given his speech. I'm going to ask if there are any questions to the speech. And these are questions, not speeches. So, a question takes approximately 30 seconds a minute to ask without a speech. If you're going to ask a question, turn it into a speech, I'll cut you short. And the Mayor will get the opportunity to respond to those questions. Then we will deal with the amendments. Yeah? 
as moved by the Green Party and as moved by Councillor Radford, which we will vote on with a card vote. And then we and then we will deal with the main budget. So depending at what point you wish to speak, you will get your councillor Morrison. It's no good shouting because okay, I can't well, I'm hear you. I'm going to stand up until I can move this amendment. Okay. <laughs> And it's just getting, it's not even mentioned within, within there. Other than what we said last year was that we would take this year the cut from CRU. It said it last year. No, it doesn't name individual organisations. But those organisations in the fact that we've reduced the CRU budget are going to be affected by the same amount. But if you want to, look, if you want to prevaricate, you want to carry on behaving like a child, you can stand up there and you'll get thrown out. If that's what you might want for your leaflets or whatever. But if you want to listen to me, I'm prepared to talk to you and I'll give you a, a, an answer to what you're asking. Do you want to do that or do you want to speak your dummy out? You want to listen and with the greatest respect, if I can just answer, yeah? I hear what you said on Radio Merseyside today. Can I just say to you that there are many, many other organisations and individual groups that are going to be faced with similar. What Councillor Mulby said after you had your say on Radio Merseyside was that we are looking at trying to put some funding together for where we can help. Now, it's not, it's not outside of that, because there's all kinds of legal things that you're not aware of around you know, what we've done, would it leave us open to leave the challenge by others and all of those things. But I'm sure if the organisation, if you shake your head all you want, I'm talking about you, know, that's why I'm running the council and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is I'm telling you the truth of where, they, where, where we're at. Now, the fact is, you can either do it that way, we will talk to you and we'll see what we can do, and council will be prepared to do that. If we had a discussion about this, and Chief Executive and everybody's working, trying to work as hard as we can to stop the damaging cuts. I just feel like I've wasted the last 25 minutes on you. But the fact of the matter is, is that's the reality of what we face. Now we can try to see what we can do to help. But I promise you, there'll be at least 100 people representing organisations across the city and individual organisations that are going to come to us saying, my granddad's care package has been cut by 40 hours or whatever. And I'll send you along to explain to them why. But if you want to, if you want, if you want to, no, you're accepting, you're not accepting that, it's not our fault either. If you want to get a, a, a response to it, I suggest that you calm yourself down, talk to Councillor Mumby, and we'll see what we can actually do. Because what you're saying is not legal. It's the budget for last year, for this year, and for next year has been set. The only thing and the CO, because you've got to ratify the 1.9% increase in council tax that we are presenting today, that's the only thing. Everything else has been, and if there's amendments, if there are amendments, they have to be in time, they have to be legal in terms of something that we can do, what we can't do, and at the moment, yours doesn't stand that scrutiny, that scrutiny. That's not me, that's what you've been told by, by, by the chief executive and by, by the city solicitor. Can I respond to that? No. Oh, no. 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 